Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kelly Mack. I'm the Vice President for Undergraduate STEM Education at the Association of American Colleges and Universities and also the Executive Director of Project Kaleidoscope. And I have the great honor of welcoming you to our Active Learning Week webinar this week. I'm really thrilled to introduce you to Drs. Lisa Stoddard and Jeff Pfeiffer, both of Worcester Polytechnic Institute, where Lisa is an assistant teaching professor holding a joint appointment between undergraduate studies and the environmental and sustainability studies program. And Jeff is an associate professor, an associate teaching professor of philosophy and international and global studies. Collectively, their teaching and research focus on social justice, undergraduate STEM education, critical theory, and critical pedagogy. Together, they have developed and piloted a number of modules that help students and faculty understand and address the ways that implicit biases can impact student learning, especially in student group work. More specifically, their work can help us in understanding the impact of institutionalized forms of stereotyping and bias that can occur both in our classrooms and also in our pedagogical methods. With that, Lisa, Jeff, I welcome you to our webinar. Thank you for joining us today and sharing your insights. It's our privilege. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thank you. We will go ahead and share our presentation here. Okay, and I will get out of your way. All right. All right, so welcome everyone. Um, so one of the things that uh, okay sorry technical difficulties figuring out how we're gonna move the the presentation forward but i think we just figured it out <clears throat> so one of the things that we're interested in i hearing from you all about is we're assuming that you're all here uh, because you um, are interested in working with students on teams maybe a lot of you have done work with students on teams um, and we all know those of us that do work with students on teams know a lot about the benefits of such work um, I'm sorry, Tanya, can you show me how we can see chat boxes here? Sure. Hold on a second. Apologies to everybody. <laughs> there you go. You should be able to see the chat boxes now up here at the bottom. Would you like me to enter some, put something in the chat box for you? Sure. Would yeah. you for a test? What's this? Click here. Chat. Okay. Okay, here we here go. Here we go. We got it. Did you find it? Oh, great. Yeah, thank yes. you. Okay. Um, so one of the things that we're interested in hearing uh, from the participants about is um, what they think about both the benefits of uh, working with students on teams, benefits for students, um, but then also the benefits of um, diverse teams for students. I'm wondering if folks have ideas about what those benefits are. Um, and so we're interested in, you know, if you all could, or a few of you that have ideas about this could type a few of the benefits that you know of or think you know of um, in the chat box, that would be great. And if you could do it so that all <laughs> panelists can see it, you know, in that option, um, so that we can all see what you have experienced as the benefits of diverse teams. Great. Yeah, so we're getting many people saying multiple multiple perspectives. Working with teams brings multiple perspectives to a particular problem or a project. 
which brings different ways of knowing um, and thinking. Intercultural competence builds that. Uh, more creative ideas on design projects, absolutely. Uh, greater critical thinking. Diverse teams make better decisions. That's very good. Um, what else? Mimics real world situations. Teamwork does. Uh, learning to work with others, more creativity. Absolutely. So this is all great. Um, and the research uh, shows that as well. So as the research shows, um, Differences in background, knowledge, point of view, experiences, things like race, gender, culture, geographic origin, uh, often results in more innovative ideas and better outcomes in both undergraduate work and in the workplace. So everything that you all are uh, pointing to uh, research shows. Um, it's also the case that the reason for this, uh, the, these studies that we're citing here sort of point to you is that um, especially with diverse teams, uh, better, more innovative outcomes result because the work is more challenging. When you're working with people that are different from you, have different backgrounds, um, bring different ideas, uh, different experiences, uh, everybody has to work a little bit harder to present their ideas clearly, uh, to convince, convince others they're valuable. Um, and so in some ways, you know, everybody brings their A game. Uh, now that's assuming that teamwork goes well, um, and it's assuming that you can utilize the benefits of diversity on your team. Uh, one of the things that um, we have found, so there's a recent study uh, done in 2016 of four STEM universities showed that 85% of students, so 85% of students across these um, four universities, there's around 800 or so students, um, experienced some team dynamics issue over the course of a year on their teams. Uh, the most common problems that people cited were things like experience with a slacker teammate, uh, experience with a domineering teammate, uh, some limited learning as a result of team dynamics issues, and then exclusion from work. And I should point out that the study was done um, by Joanna Wolf and a number of others. Joanna Wolf who is at Car Carnegie Mellon. WPI was not a part of the study, uh, but it is the case that um, our findings are similar. One of the other things that uh, we note uh, often when we talk to students and that you know, is, is well known is that um, as a result of an AACU and U employers study done in 2015, uh, teamwork is one of the most top three valued skills, though 78% of employers say that students are not well prepared to work on teams. And in part because they don't do a lot of teamwork and also in part because they deal with and, and encounter these kinds of team dynamics issues and aren't given a lot of strategies to, to deal with them. Um, so now we would like to show you a sh very short video. So we're gonna try this through Zoom. If people have problems seeing this video come through, let us know and we can put a link to the video in the chat box. Um, and if you're gonna watch it on your own, we only want you to watch up until the point where they start to describe the situation and you can stop it there. And we, we wanna go into some description on our own of the situation. Um, this video was produced by, also by Joanna Wolf. Uh, she's done a series of teamwork videos and we like to use the, the first portion of this one to kind of get a discussion going. So as you watch this, we'll start it in a minute, um, but as you watch this, think about the question that's below the image here on your screen. How might this dynamic impact the learning and experience of each student? Um, names for reference, we're gonna pull this screen down and put up the video, so you might just jot these names down really quickly. Um, the names of the students are Victoria, she's the one in the front that you see in the picture with the striped sweater. Um, Adi is um, in the white button down shirt in the background, and then Toby is in a printed t-shirt, uh, and you won't see him until we start the video. Um, but as you watch the, the, the short portion of this video, think about this question, and then we'll ask you uh, to kind of right into the chats your answers to these questions after this is done. So give me a second to switch this out here. Can you just click that? Thank you. 
So high strength, low alloy steel is our best bet. Yeah, but isn't that one more expensive? Yeah, but it's stronger and doesn't corrode as easily. Yeah, but do we have the budget for that? It's not that much more expensive. Well, we have to produce it in-house. And do we even have the right equipment for that? We can find the equipment. If you know anything about steel, you know that high strength, low alloy is the best bet. Yeah, but we don't have the money for it. And it's not like we're going to be taking the device outside. I know steel. The professor's going to want to know why we didn't choose high strength, low alloy. Because it costs too much. And we don't need it. Anybody with half a brain knows that this is a better option. All right. Well, what do you think? It's the uh, best option. We want to make a quality product. So what we'd like for you all to do now is to, to enter into the chat box. Um, first, let us know if you had any issues seeing the video and we'll share the link. But otherwise, what we'd ask is that you write down how you might think this dynamic impacted the learning experience of, of one or more students. So if you can use the student's name and write how you think that student's learning might be impacted. We'll take a few minutes and let people populate the chat for this. Yeah. yeah. All right, so you all have a, a lot of great insights here about, you know, the team dynamic that we're seeing and the impact that that has on student learning. Uh, one, one, a few people noted that um, Toby in this case is really not learning because he feels that he already has all the answers and so he's not available and open to learn. Others mentioned the same similar reaction around Victoria that in this debate, neither person is really listening uh, and so therefore not really learning anything new. Um, other people mentioned that Victoria kind of seemed deflated at the end and, and might lose some confidence. Uh, and then around Addie, a good majority of people um, said that Addie wasn't really given an opportunity to contribute at all. There's a few things that we wanted to note about that. Um, one, in terms of what we've seen in our own work with students, and this comes mostly from our student reflections, but also some, from some focus groups that we've done um, with probably a, over the last two and a half years, close to 800 to 1,000 students at this point, um, is that sometimes we may see students like Addie um, will be presented eventually as a slacker. And the way that this can often happen is that because Addie is not given the opportunity to contribute, um, first, Addie doesn't want to come back to these meetings because the meetings are pretty hostile. Addie's not able to contribute, and therefore, Addie's ideas aren't included in the project work. And this kind of results in a bit of a disinvestment for this student 
um, their ideas aren't seen, they aren't incorporated, and so they're really just trying to survive the project. And with that source of uh, survival in that circumstance, um, that student, because they may be backing away from the work, faculty as well as team members might start to see that student as a slacker because they're really not contributing quite as much. Uh, for Victoria, with students losing confidence, um, and again, you can imagine students leaving this meeting and having to go back to their dorm or another class and the kind of tension that you might feel. We've seen that experiences like Addie and Victoria may be um, instances why students may either try to avoid group work and the, the project-based learning experiences that we are so trying to push and promote um, because they don't want to be in these types of environments. Um, and then with, Ad, with uh, Toby, sorry, really not having an opportunity to learn, to take the benefits of what we talked about with diverse perspectives and ideas and experiences on teams that the students in this case, um, and similar to what we have seen, in some ways may have been better off doing a project in terms of learning on their own. Um, they may have seen more benefits than with a group. And as we're asking more and more students to work on teams because we're doing active learning and project-based learning that often requires students to work on teams, um, some of these benefits in these kinds of scenarios can be lost. So now we're gonna um, show you a little bit um, more about some of these team dynamic issues, that dynamics issues that you see in this video, some that we've already talked about. Um, in the context of both some of the research that we've been doing and some of the literature that we've been reviewing, but also some of our own experience with our own students and our own student reflections. So to back up a bit, uh, just to tell you kind of quickly about the context, uh, we both work um, in our own disciplines, but also for a um, interdisciplinary first year project based program called the Great Problem Seminars here at WPI. And um, this is a a uh, program that first year students elect to take, so it's not required of all students. Um, but it's there are seminars that are taught around the kind of world's great problems. So there's one about water, there's one about climate change, there's one about cities and urbanization, there's one about energy and a few other topics. Um, and these are team taught. So they're taught by somebody, usually somebody in the humanities or social sciences and somebody in engineering or um, one of the science fields. Um, and they're, they're kind of taught in a way to combine um, all of the various issues and problems that arise. Students work in, team, in a team environment on short-term projects, usually in the first seven weeks of the class. And then the last seven weeks of the class, they're in a project team and they choose a project uh, that sits in underneath or a problem that sits underneath the umbrella of the larger um, project. And they, as a team, you know, research the problem, think about solutions, and then you know, build out a um, both both a project that offers the backstory of the problems, and then a solution. And it ends in a you know public presentation. So they work for seven weeks on a team, and we see a lot of the kinds of team dynamics issues that you see in the video. You just saw a lot of the stuff that we saw in the study, and this really sort of is the thing that got us going on thinking about well, what do we do for students in this and and also thinking about all of the benefits that we see and that you all identified in project-based learning um seeing those really being lost as a result of these kinds of team dynamics so let me just show you one more thing about this study that um, also mirrors our experience so the same study that we showed you some data from uh, in two slides ago the one done by wolf uh, broke out the findings based on identity categories, and it showed that women and students of color experienced the issues from the, the first slide at higher rates than their white male counterparts. So white men experienced at least one of those issues, a slacker teammate, a domineering teammate, uh, limited learning or exclusion from work 23% of the time, white women 37% of the time, men of color 41% of time, and women of color 58% of the time. This also mirrors sort of the kinds of things that we've seen on our project teams. Uh, that study that we, the ASC and U study that we talked about a little bit before, um, not only said that students weren't well prepared for teamwork, but they have difficulty managing conflict and working with those who are different from them. 
So these are really the problems that, that we are interested in, problems we're interested in thinking about and trying to work through. Um, let me say, we want to say a little bit more, um, a little bit more fine grain, grained analysis about some of these issues. So let's do a little bit of this. And here's where we'll start sharing with you all some of our data from our student reflections. Um, so one of the other types of team dynamics issues that plays a role in all of those more general ones uh, is identified as in, in literature as intellectual marginalization. And this is when students' ideas are ignored, not taken seriously, or voices are silenced. Uh, here is an example of this kind of thing from our own reflections. So this is Kate, a female student of color. She's a first generation student. Um, her name has been changed, obviously. Uh, even though she says, even though I normally lead in group settings, uh, in this group, I often do not speak. I feel like every time I say something, everyone except Teresa shuts my ideas down. Mike and John always take charge. They always call the shots. Through this group project, I found that I hate confrontation. I don't like disagreeing with others. I also hate not being heard. In order to fix this, I will try not to be intimidated by Mike and John. I believe they don't ignore me intentionally. So I shouldn't be scared to speak up for what I believe, even though I might be shut down. So here, Kate is sort of showing us how intellectual marginalization, intellectual marginalization plays out. Um, in her experience, both of her team and the project work. Another issue that's more fine-grained that we see a lot of is what the literature identifies as task assignment bias. Uh, and this is when students assign themselves or others tasks based on unconscious biases of who is more or less capable or suited for specific tasks. So here's an example of this. Uh, this is from Tisha, an African-American female student um, in one of our classes. She says, I can't help but notice Jack got the more dominant role that requires a lot of extensive research and seems to outdo me and Amber in the tasks that we had to do. Now, task assignment bias uh, functions uh, in such a way uh, that, for instance, we see you know, women on teams often being relegated to roles um, like secretarial, communications, that sort of stuff, and men on teams uh, being given roles that have to do with technical tasks or mathematical tasks. And uh, so that's sort of the way task assignment bias works. And if we think about the kinds of benefits that we were enumerating before of teamwork, the benefits of diverse teams and the kinds of learning outcomes that we want our students to have, if you're working on projects and you're being relegated only to secretarial roles or only communicative to communicative roles, you don't get the experience with the more technical aspects of the project um, that when you go out into the workforce, you know, is the kind of experience that you want. And the same is true in the reverse, that if you're only being given technical roles, then you get into a team situation in the work in the workforce, you don't have the experience with communications or organization or those kinds of things. So Just one thing also to note, and this came from a, a conversation with um, faculty and students that a, a fourth year chemical engineering student talked about how you know because she did project-based learning throughout her four years here as well as in labs that because she was always either given or kind of found herself in the same role over and over again that she felt like she really lacked some of the skills that she needed when she would enter the workforce as a chemical engineer and you know, for, for those of us who are really trying to do team and active-based learning, um, that becomes a big concern if students are through their four years, either doing the same type of task or role on the team over and over again, um, really does have a, a, a long-term outcome. So moving forward then, another issue that we've seen a lot is what the literature identifies as lack of work recognition. And this is when a student's contributions are not acknowledged or when credit for work is stolen or when individual work is subsumed under the work accredited to the whole group. I have an example from our reflections of this happening to our students. So this is Teresa, a first generation Latina female student. And she says, uh, there were several in instances where either Grace or I would mention something during our meetings, but we'd be ignored. And then one of the guys would say the same thing as we said, and he would get credit for it. Um, so this is an example of the kinds of things around lack of work recognition. Another type of recognitional issue that we've 
seen uh, is one that we're identifying as extra work for the same recognition. And this is when a student has to work more than other team members in order to be seen as contributing to the same amount as them. And so this is again from Tisha, uh, the woman we heard from in the first, uh, in the first example. She says, the work we divide tends to have the same degree of work, but it still seems as if I always lag behind them. In order to do something meaningful, I have to do twice the amount of work as them, them being her other teammates. So these are, one other thing to note, uh, our students aren't necessarily intentionally engaging in uh, issues that, that cause these, or in behaviors that cause these kinds of problems. Um, so here's an example of this. This is from Josh, a white male student, uh, who is reflecting on realizing that some of the stuff is going on in his team through some of the work that we've done with students through readings and talking through and thinking about these issues. And Josh says, prior to our discussions about communication, I had assumed that Una and Maria wouldn't participate in the conversations because they had nothing to say. I was surprised when they told Oliver and I that they felt excluded from our conversations and often have things to say, but don't say them. I felt awful about this because I never meant to exclude anyone. Me and Oliver would just get caught up in our debate over our ideas. Uh, so the work that we've been doing is both uh, to try to help students that find themselves uh, it at the sort of receiving end of some of these team dynamics issues, but then also help other students realize how they're contributing to them and really to, to work to create the space where all students can gain all of the learning um, the, the opportunities for learning that active learning strategies and project-based learning really brings with it. So Lisa's gonna talk a little bit about asset mapping um, and asset charting, the strategy that we've been using for a while. Uh, before we do that, I just wanted to see through the chat, perfect, if anybody has questions about, um, about the, the data that we presented from our students on the types of issues and the associated quotes that we mentioned. Okay, it looks like we can go ahead. Oh, there we go. They're coming through. Okay, here we go. So, um, will we be sharing our slides afterwards? Yes, we're happy to do so. At what point did we ask for this information? I think this came up in regard to that further discussion. Um, oh, and asked again. Okay. Um, so, at what point do we ask for this information? So we'll share with you a, a processing sheet. Or we'll share with you a, a number of the tools that we used, but one of the tools that we use to um, have students reflect on their experiences on Teams, um, we, it, we refer to as a processing sheet. And with that processing sheet, we tend to do it about halfway through the project. Um, and so, you know, if that's a two week project, you do it at the midway point for that. For us, we have an a, almost eight week project and that would come in um, you know, at, at the kind of three, four week mark. Um, and so with that, we have the team processing sheet and then we ask our students to write some reflections and have associated reflection prompts. What we can do at the end is share um, some um, of our resources, both the slides as well as we have shared some other tools through the slides. And then also we have a handbook that we have created. Um, and one thing to note as we do share that information that we see this as a, a, an ongoing process of learning for ourselves and development of tools. Um, every time we present this, we learn from folks that we present to and work with, um, and we learn from our students every single year. Um, and so we will continue to update those materials based on previous, uh, on the things that we're learning associated with it. Um, so another question came in, uh, So there's a lot of questions about strategies. So I think what I'm gonna do is go over the strategies that we have developed, the tools that we've developed. Um, and so afterwards, after we share these tools, maybe go into, the, um, go into questions there because I think some of them might be answered by our description of the tools. Yeah, and we'll keep track of these questions and if we don't answer them, we'll address them specifically toward the end. Okay, so, um, 
Some of you may be familiar with the, with the term asset mapping. It was developed in um, the area of community development with a critique that often scientists, engineers, developers, et cetera, would go into a community and uh, kind of determine what the problem was, determine how to create the solution, um, and really focused on the community's problems and then fixing that problem and then heading out. Um, there was a flip in the approach of going into a community and starting by ask, uh, mapping that those community's assets. So the community might have issues in terms of water pollution, let's say, but where are the community's strengths? And that could be anything in, in cultural centers, religious and cultural practices, um, economic strengths, uh, local and unique knowledge about the specific place, uh, local and unique resources, etc. There's been a similar critique uh, leveled to education where um, there's been a critique of looking at students in let's say a math class where the student isn't doing as well and focusing on that student's deficit and trying to fix that deficit from a kind of an outside perspective with the flip being let's look at a student's strengths and see where they excel what they're passionate about and then based on that try to develop additional skills um, based on those existing strengths and passions and areas of interest. So um, we attended a, an AACNU um, weekend long workshop with a focus on uh, diversity, equity and inclusion uh, with some other uh, faculty and staff at WPI. And our coach there uh, recommended that we look into asset mapping, which kind of started us on this path. The way that we've modified to use this is that at the start of a project, before our students have even begun to work with one another. We ask them individually outside of class to map their own assets. Uh, and here, you know, we describe it as kind of taking an individual, an inventory of an individual's strengths and resources. So what we do is we give um, the kind of shell of the map um, with the student's name in the center, and then the first round of bubbles, so to speak, um, and the, the internal round of bubbles around the student's name are categories. Um, these categories include, as you can see, team and project-based skills, creative expression, related coursework and jobs, relevant experiences, passion and interests, etc. cetera. Um, we have also uh, created situations where we'll leave a couple of those bubbles blank for students to fill in. Um, and this can very much be adapted for your own particular course. Um, and then we ask the students to fill in uh, um, qualities, skills, resources that are linked to each of these categories. So for example, when you look at Gabriel in terms of his team and project skills, he says he's really good at diffusing conflict because he has five siblings. Um, in terms of creative expression, beginner violin, street art, fan fiction, photography, sometimes our students may not be quite aware of how these skills may help in a project, but um, for presentations, being artistic or having a sense of performance or use of music can be really effective in giving a great presentation. Um, so we start out by asking each student to map their individual assets. We also ask them, um, if you can see at the bottom, it says three areas you want to grow in. We ask them to explicitly note three areas that they want to grow in through the course of the project. Um, for this student, it was evidence-based writing, research design, and being less passive on a team. Once students share these individual maps, we ask them to get together in class. And we give them what we have here, what we refer to as a team asset chart. Um, and before they fill out this chart, we ask them to sit down and for about five minutes each, share with one another their, their assets. So let me pull back to this slide, apologies. Um, so let's say you have three or four students, each student takes three to five minutes to share their assets with one another um, and the areas that they wanna grow in through the course of the project. And then we have them do the team asset chart. So this takes an inventory of the team's strengths and resources and then also we ask them to divide up the work for the project based on those assets and areas for growth. So when you look at the chart here, you can see on the left-hand column, those are the project tasks. On the middle column, these are the student's name and the associated assets that would be linked to that particular task. 
And then in the third column, all the way to the right, the students' name, um, students' names, sorry, and areas for growth um, for that particular task. And so we expect that there will be multiple students writing their names in each of these boxes. Now, in terms of the left-hand column, we fill this out for our students. Um, we do so because we find that, especially for first-year student, a, a significant project or lab, they may not know all of the needed components for that, and so it becomes more of a um, assignment associated with how do we break down this large project versus a focus on who are the students on my team and who has strengths or interest in which of these areas and who would like to grow in which of these areas. And that's what, they really, that's what we really want them to focus on. Um, once we do this, um, we have the students submit this um, and we have for future assignments. So this is really we use for the entire kind of overview of the project. And then as they turn in assignments associated with each piece, so for example, a review of the literature or a digital or hand sketch, et cetera, they um, turn in something that we call an asset-based cover sheet. So we ask them to continue to say for each assignment, how did they divide up the work on the assignment based on student strengths as well as student areas for growth. And we ask them to often um, kind of have a leader learner scenario where if Jeff, for example, really wants to work on digital sketches, and that's something I'm very comfortable with, that we'll tackle that together, um, kind of take the lead on, on that particular aspect of the project. Um, so before, we're gonna go next into talking about the benefits. We've identified from uh, reflections and from um, our research over the last couple of years here at WPI, the benefits that we've seen in terms of equitable and effective teamwork. Um, before I do so, I wanted to see if there's any questions specifically on the use of this particular tool. Okay, so Tanya says time check, we have 20 minutes, so uh, we're, I guess we can, okay. How detailed and broad do you recommend the project tasks be? Okay, so in terms of uh, detailed or broad, the, the project tasks, um, what we do is we start out for a big overview of the task, like a review of the literature could be broken down into multiple components. I think you have to make somewhat of a judgment call, but we usually try to do a big overview with the team asset chart so teams can really see uh, what each member has to kind of contribute to the overall project. And then for smaller assignments, we would break it down into more fine grained. Um, so we're gonna pull these down so that we can uh, talk with you about the benefits and then we'll go on to more questions. So. One of the first benefits we see is that this really builds student confidence. Here's a, a, a quote from Martin, uh, identifies as a Native American first generation male student. Um, he says, the asset map shows me what I'm capable of. I plan on editing my asset map again because I'm going to need it to remind myself of what I'm good at. I feel that my asset map should be pages long by the time I'm 40. I'll continue to utilize my asset map to help me in the future. Another student, Jen, who identifies as a white female student, she says, through creating my asset map, I surprise myself with what I'm able to offer in a team project, specifically in this course focused on livable cities. I often feel intimidated by the intelligence of the people around me, as I believe I may not have as much to offer with experience or general knowledge. I may not be the smartest and I'm not a great writer, but what I lack in these areas I make up for in creativity, and I have many interests that directly correspond with this course. Um, and so we're often seeing that students um, who are first generation or students of color or female students who may be underrepresented and underserved in STEM come into our universities, um, our STEM programs with kind of anxiety about not being good enough um, and that this really does help to build confidence to show that they have the unique skills to do so. Second is students get to know each other and overcome stereotypes. 
Um, I have a quote here from Kyle, and this was a, a team of all white male students. And, and the reason that we note that here is that, um, you know, while we are focused on um, underrepresented and underserved students, that we've seen benefits for all of our students. So the quote says, I think stereotyping had some effect on what we all initially thought of each other. I saw James as the nerdy kid and Miles being completely introverted. Everyone on the team saw me as a jock type of personality that only came to college to party. The group was able to move past these unspoken stereotypes. Working on this team is different because everyone has a unique skill set and they each approach the problem at hand differently. This has allowed me to learn an enormous amount about myself and now better understand the parts of myself I have to work on when placed in a team so that it functions the most successfully. It's given me new experience on how everyone approaches, on how everyone else approaches work. Um, and the thing to note here is this, that Kyle says, you know, everyone here has a unique skill set. And of course, everyone always has a unique skill set on the team, but these are tools that are allowing those skill sets to be able to be visualized and discussed and then actually uh, utilized. And there was a question earlier about quiet students. Um, and we've noticed, I've noticed that when teams share their asset maps with each other, um, even the quiet students, uh, it helps their confidence, they're talking more, their teammates learn about them very quickly. Uh, so this is one way to think about, you know, what, you know, the, the more general category of the quiet student, you know, making the space for them to, to talk and also making them feel more comfortable in, it, in the situation with their teams. We present this work a lot in front of faculty uh, and we had, for instance, a faculty member go through, we usually take them through the process of building the asset maps and then sharing with each other. Um, we had a faculty member say, you know, in, when we were processing that activity, say, you know, I sit across from this person that I was just talking to on committees and I've done so for 10 years and I learned more about her in five minutes than I've learned in those 10 years. So it's a real dynamic process for getting people to get to know each other very quickly. Um, so the third is that it's a procedure to divide tasks and um, based on skill and interests, which can help to minimize task assignment bias. So instead of having tasks divided up by you know, who's the loudest student in the room um, or who sees themselves as kind of a leader in taking that role, you're really dividing up based on skill and interest. Um, so this comes from Stephanie, identifies as a white female student. She says, we try to use our different strengths to an advantage and build on our weaknesses as well. One example is during the interviews. We knew Josh was the best person for the job, but we all got to lead at least one of the interviews so we could gain experience. I also have a lot of experience in technical writing as I wrote up a 70 plus page portfolio for my engineering project last year. Therefore, I will be leading this aspect of the project. However, there'll be times when Josh and Rita get to lead in this area as well. We all want to make sure that our strengths are used appropriately and that we also get experience in other areas that we might not have done before. Um, and so this, this uh, brings up a question that was mentioned on the chat box of how do you get students to develop areas for growth? So we explicitly ask students when they're doing their team asset chart to talk with one another about those areas for development and then to choose one that they really want to work on and to note an opportunity to do so. Um, and we as faculty then have to allow for a draft of that assignment so that those students don't feel like they're going to be penalized with their grade. So it's both a combination of students identifying that, coming up with a plan of how they're going to work on that particular area for growth, um, and then to have faculty create the space for students to do so without being penalized through their grade. Okay. Um, the last one here, uh, or close to last, is it provides a tool to measure, analyze, and discuss inequity in team dynamics. So, where this comes in is we have students not only do this first initial team asset chart, but then with each assignment, they're noting before, beforehand who's going to do what on this next coming assignment um, based on what areas, uh, what assets or areas for growth, and then they have to submit what they did uh, with the actual assignment. And that this allows us to be able to see and then the students to document and note Who's being assigned which tasks? Are they using their assets? Are they getting opportunities for growth? This comes from Nora, who identifies as a female student of color. She says, because of the stereotype that women are better suited for secretarial type roles that are considered more feminine, they're often assigned roles that focus on organization. 
Reflecting on my own experience, I realized this was very accurate for my own group. While John and Arjun focused heavily on finding new technologies, Katie and I conducted other research that was still important, but not so focused on specific technologies. I was also assigned the role of email coordinator in conducting the interviews. I was not aware of how this, how this stereotype was affecting our group, nor did I think it was a problem. Some strategies that my team could use to make the team dynamic more effective is switching up the types of roles we do every now and then. That way, Katie and I get more experience with the technologies and John and Arjun get more experience with the organizing. I also think it would be beneficial for each of us to reflect on the biases each of us have and think about how it's affecting the group. So the students were able to kind of look at these processes happening if people were allowed to be able to um, really uh, contribute based on their assets or be uh, provided opportunities for areas for growth and then to be able to come up with a solution of how to switch up roles so that they were um, getting more opportunities to do so. Um, yeah, go ahead. So quickly, um, we just want to share this with you and then we can open it up for some discussion and questions. Um, one of the things that we realized very quickly when we started doing this work, uh, we collected asset maps from all of our students. Um, and so we have somewhere around 500 of those in addition to a number of reflections and patterns we saw emerging were that the asset maps kind of met, matched our kind of gendered and um, other uh, social stereotypes. So for instance, women on their asset maps reported assets in communication and organization and men in leadership and technical expertise and those kinds of things. And so we were thinking about that and worrying about reproducing those kinds of uh, dynamics. Um, and that's why we added the areas to grow. So here, this is a student sort of realizing uh, through the work that we've been doing how stereotyping and bias has impacted uh, her experience. So this is Tony, a female student of color. She says, in my experience working in groups, it made me feel as if I shouldn't speak or contribute anything to the group because I have nothing worthy to bring to the discussion table, which is not true at all. I realize that this has been going on for a long time through my primary and part of my secondary school life, that when I got, it got to be times I had to lead in my group and my, lead my group into finding a solution, I was faced with anxiety. So this is built up over years. Um, and so part of what we wanted to do was to try to obviously figure out how to disrupt this, to give students more confidence. The asset mapping seems to help with some of that, but we wanted to add, we added the categories of or areas to grow to the asset maps in the hope of really helping students on teams think about making space for everybody to gain experiences they didn't have before so that when they move on to their next project or to their next class or into the workforce, they can actually say, yes, I've done the technical piece of this project. Yes, I've done the organizational piece of this project. Uh, so really trying to, to in, a, in a concrete way, work to disrupt some of this, uh, these kinds of cultural and social stereotypes and biases that have real material impacts on people. Um, Maybe we should show one of okay. these quickly. Sure. So the last here we're going to talk about is some additional tools that we use um, as kind of part of this work. Um, so the first one's a team processing sheet that I mentioned before where students work through a set of questions to assess how the team is functioning in terms of equity and productivity. Um, I'm going to click on this um, to get, show you uh, some of these questions. Um, so we ask each student to play the role of a facilitator on each set of questions. Again, we do this about halfway through the team project. Um, so the first one is about team communication. Who talks the most in your group? Who talks the least? Why that may be a problem? How might that impact the productivity of the group or feelings of equity and inclusion? Um, we do the same for team leadership, team decisions, team commitment. Uh, who comes to meetings, who makes space in their schedule to ensure that other members can come to meetings, team productivity, um, and then there's kind of an other box um, that we have, have added some questions to. This has been developed and refined based on student feedback. Uh, one of the things that our students have liked that is because there are um, numbers that could be attached to each of these questions, who talks most, who talks the least, it's not just a general question about how's communication going because they said they don't feel that they would be honest in that kind of scenario. Uh, just minimize, okay. 
Um, the second two, I'm just going to describe quickly. The first one is um, a self-assessment. This, some of this comes from Joanna Wolf's book, as well as a couple of addition, additional self-assessments, where students take these assessments to really reflect on how they tend to play, how they tend to work on teams. Um, do they tend to be the person who kind of talks the most, talks the least, that kind of thing, reflect on past experiences? Um, and then they meet with their team and come up with an associated communication and deadline agreement. So communication would be, are we going to have, are we going to communicate by text? Um, and what's going to be the expectation of when people are going to get back to one another? There's also the deadline agreement. So um, when Jeff is assessing his work styles, he might be someone who likes to have something done five days ahead of time. And I like to work in the middle of the night right before the deadline. And that's when I'm the most productive. So how are we going to manage those types of things? And the last is the asset-based cover sheet that we mentioned before, where students for each assignment do kind of a mini team asset um, chart. So they're just noting who did what based on what air assets or what areas for growth. And they're doing that for each assignment. Um, the reason we added this is that when we did the team asset chart for the overview of the project, students found that to be really helpful. But without the follow through, they ended up re reverting to past patterns of Jeff's going to do this part because he always does that part and I won't have that same opportunity and vice versa. So we want to open it up to questions. Uh, Tanya, we talked with you about uh, unmuting people so mm -hmm. that they can ask questions with their own voices. Yes, um, that's right. Now that we're opening it up to questions at the end, um, I would ask that you, if you'd like to type in your question, please type it into the question answer tool that will help us keep track of which one we've answered already. And if you'd like to ask your question out loud, raise your hand and I will unmute you so you can, we can hear your voice. I know there might be a few questions on, in the chat um, that we can look, see if we can, I don't know if you've, um, yeah, I mean, we can just all can. of them. Here's a question from Ann Delaney. You, um, <laughs> um, yeah. do you do you have people submit these on paper from a logistical standpoint? How do you implement this so that the results actually get processed to be useful in a timely manner? Yeah, so we um, we use the Canvas learning system, um, and so we have them submit all of that stuff via Canvas. And uh, between us and in the in our classes, we do have peer learning assistants, and so they often will uh, help us work on those things, but the asset map, uh, the asset chart, the reflections that we have associated with those, when it, all of that stuff is in the handbook and we'll find a way to get everybody a link to that if, if you're interested. Um, they have associated reflections, those reflections also come in and they are assignments as a part of the project. So we grade them as we grade uh, other stuff as it comes in. So it's kind of happening all at the same time. So. Yeah, and so the, you know, some of the things are, are, are pretty, we intend for them to start to become routine. So the kind of asset based cover sheet where with each assignment they're submitting it, they submit that at, you know, the last slide in their presentation or the last page of their report or something like that, um, with the idea that it becomes routine. Um, there was also a question about, you know, maybe I'm in the middle of the project and I've realized I have some team issues. Can we do this once the team has already started working together? And absolutely. Yeah. We've done that and done some um, combination. In some cases, I've just used the processing sheet at kind of a moment where students were in trouble and that helped. Um, and then also going back and having students halfway through the project or more looking at one another's assets can provide a nice kind of reset of, all right, let's start working together effectively now. There was a question earlier also about um, thinking about shorter term team projects. So somebody asks, Denise asks about short projects like a two hour lab. We have a Davis Foundation grant to take some of the work that we've been doing and kind of spread it across campus and across different uh, classes that utilize projects. Uh, from lab classes to one week projects to you know our larger three you know 16 week projects that we do uh, so we're looking at a variety of different ways to think about changing things to 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 make them match the scale and um, and time that, 
that projects function in. So we'd be happy to hear from you all about ideas you might have, or if you want to connect with us, we can talk to you about the kinds of things we've done so far and, and that sort of stuff. Yeah, and I, I think for Denise, you know, in terms of your question that, that Jeff just brought up, um, because that's something that we're actively working on right now, we have a pilot of 15 faculty, and some of them are working in specifically technical courses versus you know, ours is an interdisciplinary course and figuring out how to make that fit. Um, that if you want to contact, uh, contact us directly, that's something that we're currently in the midst of figuring out and that we will be publishing and providing some resources on. Um, another question was asked about, are we going to share our resources? Yes, we are. And may you share them with other colleagues? And yes, we um, have put kind of a copyright in our name just so that um, because this is part of our own work that um, we just ask people to, to cite us in, in those kinds of contexts. We have two more minutes left of the webinar. So um, I think we ha have time to look, for, look at one more question um, and then we do need to wrap it up to stay on time. Um, there's a um, question in the question answer that says, have you, from Gloriana Trujillo, have you ever done longitudinal studies to see how long these skills persist in the student's academic career? Because we've only been doing this for about two years, we don't have that data, uh, but it's certainly something that's on our minds. So. Yeah, and it's something that, you know, we've, with the Davis grant, we've gone from just a focus of doing this in our first year class, because there's a project at WPI in every year, as well as labs and other project opportunities that we're going, we're trying to institute it Davis Grant's allowing us to institute it across the curriculum, and so we're collecting that data now. Well, um, there are so many more questions coming through the question answer and the chat box at this point, and so I was wondering, um, perhaps we can follow up with um, those folks um, offline to address their questions. Um, sure. So yeah. we can make sure we do get your question answered. Um, because we're excited to continue the discussion. Um, I'll be posting the webinar on our STEM Central website. Um, so that will be a place you can ask additional questions and we can post the answers to that in the discussion thread on STEM Central. Okay, and Tanya, you can let us know what you think is the best way for us to share those resources that okay. we have. Yeah, I can share a link with everyone who's attended, uh, but we will have a special page set up just for all the resources associated with this webinar on yeah. Great. Central. Great. All right. So, um, with that, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today. Um, it was a wonderful, fascinating um, discussion and information, and hopefully we'll have more inclusive team dynamics moving forward in the in our educational settings. So uh, with that, thank you so much, Jeff and Lisa, for sharing um, your research with us for the Active Learning Week webinar. And I hope you all um, tune in to our future webinars and um, take some lessons from this webinar and apply them to your own um, research or classroom setting. Any final words from you guys, Jeff and Lisa? No, thank you for um, listening to us and uh, we look forward to hearing from everybody. Yeah, thanks so much for the opportunity and, and we're excited to hear how you all might use it and how we might learn from you as well. Right, so we'll continue the discussion. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks.